So I'm going to ask Pam to introduce our speaker tonight since she um, is friends with uh, this person and, and recommended him to come and speak to us. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a very old, old friend, Steve Medeiros, who, um, when I look back over the arc of his career, um, he's probably like the guide's guide. I met him in the 1980s when he was interpreting at Tensbury. He then came to Independent, then to Poe, where he recently retired. And he's now guiding at Walt Whitman in Camden. And he's going to talk to us about Edgar Allan Poe's Philadelphia and has brought along a number of artifacts from his collection to share with us. So please welcome Steve Medeiros. Thank you all. I recognize a few and thank you Zoom people as well. Um, when I got to Poe, I re realized how important um, this area of Philadelphia was because Post House is actually at Seventh and Spring Garden. So in his day, that was actually the suburbs. So this was the heart of the publishing area. And I got to appreciate the 19th century and what it gives to us. In fact, we see history a lot through the prism of the 19th century um, because I was, in my days of working at the National Park Service, I was relegated to work at the Liberty Bell. And this is the old Liberty Bell Pavilion, for those who remember. There's only the bell and us and everyone coming in and everybody asking about the crack, which of course wasn't the crack. Everything we knew about the bell or what people thought was the bell was wrong. Then I realized how the 19th century shaped our ideas about the bell. In fact, even, even giving it its name, the Liberty Bell, the Friends of Freedom. And the idea that the Liberty Bell rang on July the 4th, which never happened from a story that was published in 1847 by a friend of Edgar Allan Poe named George Lepard. And I'll talk about him in a couple of minutes. It's one of the few um, buildings that survived. It's the old uh, Society Hill Hotel. That's one of the publishing places and that's where Lepard was. And then going to Poe, I, I realized that people are also having these wrong ideas about Poe, that he took drugs, that he died in the gutter, that he wrote these horror classics because he was crazy. Not understanding that there's a whole world, you gotta realize that the guy was trying to make money. Now he had his problems, there's no doubt about that. Drugs are not one of them, but drink, yes, okay? So there, there are things about Poe, but he is primarily doing something because there was a market for it. Okay, so there's a lot of different, this is a nice, called the Dollar Magazine out of New York. Nor do people understand that when Poe was living in Philadelphia, there's no mustache. What most of his adult life, the only last couple of years of his life that he had a mustache. There's another one as well. Sure. Can I actually maybe do this? Yeah, I really feel like a comedian of sorts or something. And then of course we have the Poe that will look a bit dire. This is towards the end of his life in 1848. And then we recreated Poe for the masses, okay? 
as rather cool. The gods have, uh, yeah, have adopted him as well. People, of course, come to the Poe House because of October. We emphasize October, or we used, well, I used to emphasize. I have to remember this is all past tense for me now. I've not worked the Poe House since right before the pandemic, and then I retired last year. Um, so they come in October because of Halloween, but actually we emphasize October because he died in October, okay, 1849. Then I realized how important Philadelphia was in its publishing. Why is he here? He's here for six years, 1838 to 1844. He arrives right around the time Pennsylvania Hall. There's a marker, I think it's uh, H uh, W H Y Y. okay? It burned down after being newly built. So there was an um, white and black folks went in together and crowds will resent that and burn it to the ground and the firemen would not put out the fire and the mayor didn't stop it and so forth and so on. And he left one month before the nativist riots that actually begin up in what, a couple of blocks away in yeah, Kensington, right? This is the second half that will be in South Philly. St. Philip Neri is seen right over here. And then there's a photograph or daguerreotype, 1844, the first bank of the United States with the crowd out in front. This is May of 1844. I happen to like this photograph because of a couple of things, not only showing people gathered, and it's about the first photojournalist photograph, okay? But it also is showing where newspapers are. This is where the Museum of the American Revolution is. Right there, okay? It is also where at one time, this newspaper was published. We know it as the Philadelphia Inquirer. It would have been the Pennsylvania Inquirer and it was published right there on Third Street, and I believe it will be right where the Museum of the American Revolution. What I like about this too as well, folks, is all the news that's fit to print plus advertisements, but also they are serializing Martin Chuzzlewit, Charles Dickens, who had come to Philadelphia in 1843 as part of a year-long uh, observance of the United States and Martin Chuzzlewit is based on his observations of Philadelphia and actually Poe would meet at um, where Dickens was staying on Chestnut Street two different times. I have a photograph of that. Is that good? Okay. Can you recognize the book, the uh, building right here? It was closed by this time. It had closed down because of the panic of 1837, closed down in 1841. Park Service has it as an art gallery, Portugal Gallery. That's the second bank in the United States. So the U.S. Hotel right across the way. So roughly where the, what is it known today? Franklin? No, the, um, the hotel that's there now. Renaissance? The Renaissance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It had several different names. It's roughly where it is. And that's where Charles Dickens was. Harold is a as a hero, as he complained about mo uh, mobs of people going up to him, glad handing him, you know, in an American way, very abrupt, very um, enthusiastic, and he would complain about this. Um, and this is what people like Poe would aspire to: someone who is well known and can get paid for it. The problem was on both sides of the ocean that Martin Chuzzlewit can be published in a newspaper or knockoffs and no, nothing went to Mr. Dickens. There's no international copyright agreement until the 1890s. So that's part of the problem. You could be famous, but you don't ne necessarily have to be wealthy. But this is like downloading for free today. You know, we love that idea, but how much of that is affecting the artist? I mean, basically that's what's, what they're arguing about, right? The screenwriters? The actors, okay, AI now is, is the real big concern. So where was the main publishing area of Philadelphia? When 
When Mr. Poe arrives, he arrives at a place where he'll find some employment. I forgot to take this out. Nah, uh, uh, not yet. I think we're good. I'm going to show you what magazines look like at time. This is his first magazine that he worked for, Burton's Gentleman's Magazine. A short story known as William Wilson is in this. It also appears in the back, Edgar A. Poe, late editor of the Southern Literary Messenger. I'm trying to read it at the same time and showing it. Is now associated with W.E. Burton in the conduct of the Gentleman's Magazine. This is how Poe is gonna make money through the magazine. Hopefully he can make his own, have his own magazine. Right now he'll work for others, contribute being a book editor, a uh, reviewer, and then contribute poems and short stories. So this would have William Wilson, also the Pitt and Pendulum, would be originally published in Burton's Gentleman's Magazine, but I can't afford that. That's too expensive. All right, so where was Burton's Gentleman's Magazine? Here's the, for the Zoom people. I'll show you first. There it is. So I hate seeing my bald head too. Okay, so maybe I should show also point to what that is. Birch's auction it's before it burned down in 1852 or four. Resurrected by the Park Service in the 1970s as a concession tavern. That's City Tavern. So Burton's Gentleman's Magazine was in the backyard of City Tavern facing a building that you well know, Birch Exchange, completed in 1834. Part of the Merchant Exchange would have the post office. So this is why all the publishing houses will be near that building, because that's where you can send things out to the rest of the United States. And so that will happen in Franklin's time with the post office was on Market Street and the printers are on Market. Then they move to Chestnut Street behind us, and then finally to this building, and then up this way on Market. And then that's where it's going to follow, going up to Washington Square. Public Ledger, Public Ledger, which was first published in 1836. Most newspapers at this time period would be subscription. This is known as a penny newspaper, a penny for an entire newspaper size of it, one sheet of paper, printed on both sides, all the news fit the print for a penny, six days a week. It will include things that they would not publish in legitimate papers like the Pennsylvania um, Inquirer, like things that, you know, people died of horse accidents, killings, things like that. So people will begin to have a taste for violence and for scurrilous things. So there is a gentleman who's going to make a living. Yes. Penny Dreadful is right around the same time and then afterwards as well. And perhaps that's the reason why they're called Penny Dreadfuls because they would cost a penny. But I don't know much about that, but it's beginning during this time period. The other side of the ocean is, is having this as well. So you'll start to get this in the 1830s and 40s. So this gentleman is going to give us the premier book of the time period, the 1840s, and this also this wonderful expression of Philadelphia, the Quaker City, George the Parts, Monks to Monks Hall, or Quaker City. Now, this is a knockoff from the 1870s, but it would have been eventually uh, published in the same way, pamphlet form, and I think 10 issues. And they tried, when you talked about the uh, Walnut Street Theater uh, a little bit earlier, where you had some questions about that. Um, so the Walnut Street, uh, Street Theater uh, did a version of this. I think they, they couldn't put it on because there were too many people asking for tickets and there was gonna be a riot. So this was, I think the most read uh, book before Uncle Tom's Cabin. And we hardly see it today. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a problem with a lot of 19th century stuff. 
I would love to tell you that I read everything that I have on this table, but no. Um, 19th century fiction uh, or anything is a little too flowery for me. Um, if you can get through it, it's a very sensual kind of book. And it's actually based on a murder took place. Yeah, so he draws it from there. But yeah, it, it tends to be a bit episodic. Um, but you're, you're not the only one that feels that way. What's so good about Poe is that he's concise. He believes in the power of a short story, that you can read it in one sitting. And that's the enduring factor of Poe. But most people don't read everything that Poe put out, only just the tip of the ice. Yes, the question uh, or, or the observation really was that he read, would you say about 100 pages of this before you threw it out? Obviously not a, a 19th century version. This is Quaker City. Okay. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm not used to being there. This is what George Lepard looked like in his heyday. He dies of, of uh, TB at 32 or so, 31, somewhere in there, early 1850s. He's buried at, um, uh, I think it's Longcrest in Rockledge just outside the city. So uh, when Poe dies at 40 and people are used to tisk tisk, there's a lot of people who die at an early age. All right, so let's see. Um, Poe would make his greatest fame, I think, when he worked for William Graham. This is third in Chestnut Street. The only building that I can identify here that has survived is this one right here that says Times. Um, that was for the Spirit of the Times, which George Lepard worked in. Uh, I worked in a public ledger building um, in one of the floors here. I don't know if it's the second or third, was Graham's Magazine. So he would have such uh, enduring um, um, short stories as um, Murders in the Rue Morgue, for instance. So he starts the whole idea of uh, detective uh, fiction, though the word detective is not used yet. Here is a copy of what Graham's Magazine would look like right there. Okay, so we'll come as a monthly. What I can't understand, and I never got really my complete um, understanding of this, is that often what you have is that you have volumes as thick as this around. Now, this is Sartain's magazine. I don't know if you know the name Sartain, John Sartain. Yeah. Okay, so I had a magazine for about a year. Uh, I'll open this in just a moment. Uh, this will show the bell. So um, uh, Poe's famous, I don't know, maybe it's not famous, the bells, familiar with that? Um, that was painted, uh, I'm sorry, that was published after his death. But what I don't understand is, did Sartain, for instance, provide after a year covered versions that went into libraries or booksellers, or in the case of this person, Binding it themselves, which is a possibility of taking all the Sartain copies for a year and binding it. And here is, let me see if I can show that first and then back up. There we go. And that's the Bells and what it would look like when it's published in 1849 after Poe's death. Um, Sartain's um, roughly at Third and Walnut Street. So that's where the Rush Garden is. So that's where his magazine. So you can see all within the historic area, the park, the park that I knew for all these years, did not, you know, I did not understand this, this layer of the 19th century, which was right there. This is at a time that Independence Hall was City Hall and federal courts and not the historic structure as we now know it. Um, so we have things like that going on. It's also time for women. They can go toe to toe with men being in part of the publishing game, either as writers themselves, or in the case of this person, Sarah Hale, a publisher. Yeah, do you know, you've heard of her. Yeah, you'll see her plaque. You go up Franklin Court, you'll see the plaque where Godey's Ladies Book was. She was the editor 
of Godey's latest book for almost like 40 years, from 1837 to the 1870s. She was also, um, we will know about her in other ways. Mary's lamb, yeah, Mary had a little lamb, yeah. And also petitioning um, President Lincoln to make um, Thanksgiving, yeah. So what did her book like look like, her magazine? Uh, this is a rather bad copy because it's just showing part of it here. So again, very thin, but then you can make volumes of it. You can show there should be one on that too. It shows um, fashion plate. Mm -hmm. So again, here's a year's verse, or actually this is his sixth month, January to June of 1845. Okay. And this is the best known magazine of the era. The problem with magazines, there are a lot of magazines. People have the wrong impression that everyone's illiterate. This is not so. Just as, look at the proof. I haven't shown, I've only shown you one newspaper. I'll show you the other two. This is one of lesser known Edgar Allan Poe stories, one of the ones I can actually afford. He will, he will have published uh, Cask of Amontillado in 1846 while living in New York. Uh, and that will appear in Cody's latest book originally. The reason why New York, guys, is that actually, I always thought of Philadelphia as plan B. Uh, he goes to New York after Richmond. His, his real career begins in Richmond, where he's an editor of the Southern Literary Messenger, contributing paper um, um, stories there and poetry. A lot of, uh, of his earlier stories come out of there. He's been doing this since he was 18, um, starting to self-publish first and then go on. And then he decides to step forward and go to the north where the real meat was. They'll go to New York. But 1837 is a very bad year, the panic of 1837. Banks closed, people were thrown out of work. There wasn't enough money to go around. What I think, though I, I cannot prove, is that he comes to Philadelphia because we're weathering it better until 1841. That's when the Bank of the United States closes. And then it's a depression through that, throughout the United States. And in 1841, he'll work for Graham's magazine. What he's trying to do is get his own magazine. He only works for Graham for about a year. Things start to improve in 1844. And that's when he leaves to go to New York in 1844, April 6, 1844. From that house that is a National Park Service site. That's the only house that survives. He's in there for about a year. Uh, and he'll leave there April 6, 1844. And New York was his last address until he dies in 1849. So New York is really becoming the centerpiece. Uh, Harper's, uh, Putnam, if those names are familiar to you, they're there in New York at that time. Okay, so that's where the real juice would be. But Philadelphia cannot be ignored. 19th century is so important. Um, and it's fabricating this entire thing. Um, I'll, let me go back to the part for one minute. Because I have, let me see if this is it. Because I have to read you something. And as tour guides, you might, you might know. This is still the wrong one. Poe um, probably would have been better if he wrote something about George Washington or the American Revolution. He decides to be a little bit more grander. And that's why he, I think, survives while a lot of people like Lepard are forgotten, who decide to, re, uh, to, to, to write things about Washington when they're not writing about monks of Monk, Monk's Hall and that kind of ilk. Uh, he writes something about the legends of the American Revolution about the 4th of July. And that is the story that's really part and parcel of that one image that I showed you now, they're all scattered all around, of the boy coming to the bell ringer. Does anybody know that story? Or you've seen, you've seen it in the Liberty Bell Pavilion or Center today. Um, I don't think I have a copy of that. Um, that? Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So in the 
original story, the, the little boy isn't really coming up the stairs. He shouts to the bell ringer to ring because he was having his, hearing the 56 men inside the room deciding on the declaration and signing it. And then he announces it. All this comes from the 4th of July, 1776. You good? It's still frozen. Okay. Okay. And then I don't know if you've, anybody has ever heard this. You might have to work at Independence Hall. Um, I've gotten this maybe, and I, I worked there from 1991 to the end of 2021. Uh, about someone appearing inside Independence Hall in a robe. Um, this is a story that has its interest um, in a 20th century where there was a gentleman who was a Manly P. Hall, who was a spiritualist or whatever, wrote something like this, said it was from the writings of Thomas Jefferson, his secret diary. You got it? No? Secret diary. Can you hear me? Okay. And um, it was later quoted by um, Ronald Reagan in 1957. And once in a while, some uh, people will come up, religious or otherwise, and mention this person who is appearing before the, we're back, okay? So here is the speech of the unknown. And I don't know if I wanna read it since you threw it. Um, the part away. It's kind of, you know what I'll do is I'll just open it up to the page and let you look at that. Okay, when we have time to do that. And let me... Gents? Yeah. Gents? Yeah. Okay. It is fairly dense. It's meant to be uh, overly flowery. I mean, Dickens is like that as well. Um, and that's what everything was. Um, you know, everybody's taking from the traditions of sermon style and then secularizing it. And that's what's popularizing that. And it's what's happening with Whitman too, with Leaves of Grass. So it has an energy of its own and so forth. Now we're, we live more in a visual age, age. So there you have it. So what other goodies can I show you? And what I can do is maybe place them somewhere and then kind of let you peruse it. So I showed you public ledger. Here's another one. Find the one that's also in that same building, public ledger building, the dollar newspaper, which is exactly a dollar a year. And what they would publish was usually stories, poetry. Poe wins $100 for the gold bug in a dollar newspaper. That's several thousand dollars in our money today. So that was a very popular story. I don't have that one because obviously that's too expensive as well. And this is a little bit past our period, but it's still the same size and so forth. This is 1858. So we will have newspapers fit for any style, abolition newspapers, African newspapers, working class newspapers, magazines for women, for men, the usual shelf life of magazine is one year, it's like those startup um, companies of the late 1990s and then that bubble burst. So it's roughly like that. So this was a, a very vital part that, that Poe was trying to get into. And if he would have lasted into the 1850s, he may have done well with it. Um, however, um, he tends to piss off people, uh, especially when he's criticizing them people who could help him and that would hinder him as well. But we know today, despite all that, but the main thing I wanted to say is how rich this time period yet was. Yes, hard to read, hard to digest, but nonetheless it's framed us in many of the stories that people come to the park or to the historic area believing actually have the roots in the 19th century, not necessarily from Poe, but from this rich time period that he lived in. And this is primarily the antebellum. So what I mean before Civil War, we had that, the beginning of what was known as the American Renaissance happening in New England on the high-minded, but also in this low kind of George Lepard way as well for the masses, okay? Is that enough? Any questions? 
I never heard that, but I wouldn't. What do you know what year? Um, the question is about whether Walnut Street was publisher row. Do you've, that might have been also later on because I think Curtis is from the early 20th century. And that's where the publishing will go, Washington Square. If you look at those buildings. So again, where was that main post office was? Ninth and what? Ninth and Market? Was it? Is that it? The one on the, uh, the old post office building. So you move where that's. So they began to move in different areas. Yes. Uh, Looking at, yes, um, we will become the center of the question was about the, the medical publishing as well. And then I think we become the center of that well into the, yeah. Yeah, so that that's probably what survives out of Philadelphia while main publishing is in New York. Uh, never as deep as that. What the um, he will live first. Um, the the question was where did Poe to live in Queens Village? Not that I've ever seen. What we've what we've seen mostly is around this area. He'll come usually when he comes to a city, go to a boarding house. So that was on Mulberry, which is Arch, and we're right somewhere in there. And then I think there are two places on on that. Then he will live in Sixteenth and Locust. And that's where his young bride, who's his cousin, develops TB. So then he wanted to move outside the city, outside of the congestion, the filth. And that's where he goes to about, I think, 25th and Fairmont. So in the direction of the art museum. But it's across from a, a, a place where they used to, the night, night soil men, yes? No? Um, they used to take care of the privies. When I dig out the privies, that's where it all got dumped dried out, sold as fertilizer. So that's not a good place to be. So then he comes over here at 7th and Spring Garden. What's so interesting about the house at 7th and Spring Garden, it wouldn't be surrounded by other houses. It was in the suburbs. Center City, Philadelphia is the city of Philadelphia. We're in the county of Philadelphia, but the city is on, only between Vine and South and the two rivers. So most of it is built from City Hall on down this way. So he's in the Spring Garden District in the county of Philadelphia. So the house is facing south, good for her, the sun, and also have breezes since they're not in a back alley or something. That's why we surmise that he went there. So that's the only one that survives. And then eventually when he goes to New York and all the way out to Fordham, which is in the Bronx, that's in the middle of fields. It was a cottage, you know, it wasn't built up until 1920. Yes. Was okay, yeah. Um, the question is, yeah. Uh, I think politics. Yeah, a lot of it's. I guess I can say this now since I'm not Park Service, so it's 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 politics. The question was, if we focus on Independence National Historical Park on the Revolution, the early Republic, and yet we have the site, the Edgar Allan Poe National Historic Site, that was. Actually, a private museum, Richard Gimble, those who were around Philadelphia for a long time, Gimble family, and Gimble's department store, he's a major collector of this kind of stuff, post stuff, really, really important stuff, like the manuscript of the murders in the Rue Morgue, for instance. Uh, big Tom Payne collector as well. He buys the property at auction in, in the time of the Depression, early 1930s, 33 makes it into a museum in 34. He wills it to the city in 1970, 71 when he dies. Through the free library, they were running it. And then they negotiated with the park service to make it into a park site and have on a one day, I think it's November 11th, 1978, 11 parks were created around that time period, including this one. I think our representative at that time was the one who was gonna be involved in Abscam. No, it's another, I can't remember his name now. The name will come to me, but I, I remember something. No, it's not that late. There's some way earlier than that. The Alberg, I don't, I have to think. Hmm? No. 
yeah, I can't remember exactly the, from what I, the story. So it was a, it was a, and so what, what basically what it was is that we would have the same superintendent, but it, for a lot of years, it would be a separate crew. So when I went up there, it was called unit sites. So I went up there exclusively, and then we worked the Kosciusko house at third and, um, and Pine. And then we would have the Germantown White House and also um, Old Swedes. So we would not staff those. Uh, and then we all got included into the one park and then be assigned there like several days a week. So I was very fortunate when I first got up there that I was working there exclusively. So I had a free hand to, to do a lot of research on this and, and take it the direction I wanted to take it. The problem was with doing a tour, as I found out, and when I was concentrating on doing the tour for Poe here, it was all here. And then we would have questions. Oh, and I would have questions. When are we going to go up to the Poe house? And I said, well, it's a little too far. There's nothing really between, you know, so it wasn't really a, a good way to do a tour about publishing uh, when you're not including the Poe house. And he's, you know, so far out that you really can't walk it. Probably now, you can, well, still you can't really. And a lot of people have trouble doing that. But it's all down here. Mostly on Chessman Street. Or Walnut Street, maybe later on. Though there are some publishing places during time of Poe on Walnut as well. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is about was he in West Point? Yes. And in fact, there was a recent movie about that. Um, yes. Um, the only way you can become an officer in those days was to go to the point. Um, he had problems with his foster father. All right, let me go back, back, back around with Poe. Poe is the offspring of actors. Actors were held in ill repute. They were usually touring. His mother would be at the Chestnut uh, Street Theater. It used to be over here, Caddy Corner to Independence Square. She'd perform, I think, from the age of nine. She's in Richmond. The father, David Poe who was not a good actor, but loved her. So acted with her until he kind of trails off, probably was drinking as well. His father was a very important man in, in Baltimore. Uh, he helped um, fund uh, Marquis de Lafayette's uh, troops. Uh, he helped defend Baltimore during the War of 1812. So the Poe name was very important to Poe. Elizabeth um, Poe dies perhaps of tuberculosis at the age of 24. She leaves three children behind. Poe gets the best of the lot. He is not formally adopted by the Allens in Richmond. He's a merchant, tobacco and other things. Um, he even goes to England with the family. So some of his rich imagery, William Wilson, for instance, comes from his time as a kid when he was in England. Um, problem is, is that the old man and he did not get along, especially when he becomes a teenager. And he's got a real, you know, he's rather mouthy, Edgar Allen. He knows how to drive and he's very good at stabbing people, you know, not literally, but, you know, figuratively, and knows how to get at this guy. Eventually he gets kicked out of the house and he joins the army as Edgar A. Perry. He's up in Boston. He gets shipped down to at one point down to Sullivan's Island, Fulton Moultrie. So if anybody is familiar with the gold bug, it takes place at Sullivan's Island, okay? Um, he gets into good graces with his foster father again, especially after his foster mother that he adored and she adored him, dies. And he gets the old man to pull some strings to get him into the point. Because he went as far as he could as a soldier as a sergeant major. Usually you make sergeant major after being 17 year, uh, years, and he can do it in like in 17 months. He becomes an artificer, so he's make, he can make bombs. So, okay, he goes to the point and is thrown in with, well, he's a southerner, because he's raised as a southerner in Richmond, though he's born in Boston initially. But she dies in Richmond. So he'll have all the characteristics of the southerner. He's thrown in with westerners like from Kentucky, Tennessee. Okay, they're a rowdy bunch. Uh, and I think, and I, I reviewed some of the things that 
he was forbidden to do or have. He can't have any books, any novels, any plays, um, you know, only what is the curriculum. So there's a real stifling. And Poe doesn't like to be boxed in. And he then says, I, I got to get out. As he wanted to get out of the army, which he did, he, he actually got uh, his foster father to, to, to um, what's, he did this in the Civil War when, you, when, when you're a rich guy and wanted a substitute. So he hired a substitute. Um, so in order to get out of the point, you, the best way to do this is to be court-martialed. So don't show up for duty. Don't go to church. Wasn't anything extravagant. So he gets kicked out and that's the end of his time. And by that time, the foster father, yeah. So he will never refer to himself as Edgar Allan Poe. You'll see how his name appears, Edgar A. Poe. It was important, his Poe name, not because of his father, because of his grandfather. That was important to him. But you have that specter of his foster father. But then again, if you think about this, it's sometimes it's the negative that forces you to do great things. So if he got along with his foster father, okay, I will do what you say and I will work in the business, we would never have heard of him. I, 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 I give credit to Poe for wanting to do his thing, even to go to great cities like New York and Philadelphia, not Boston. Boston's gonna be a bit of a problem for him, but at least Philadelphia and New York, where he's dealing with abolitionists, it's not really a pro-abolitionist, and trying to, 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 be, to get his foothold. But of course, he's, he, he has a drinking problem, not when he's writing. He is complete, you, in, to, to write his work, he's gonna to have to be completely sober. It's those other interludes that he could be having trouble. And we don't know if he's a, he's a binge drinker or, or he has a low tolerance for alcohol, that can never be solved, but he did have a problem. Um, I used to say to people too, that if I saw him approaching and knocking on my door, I wouldn't answer it uh, because he probably would want money. So you get a little bit of that, but then you have a bunch of these, these are writers, these are artists. And uh, a lot of them had problems folks <laughs> that we don't read about. Um, even Longfellow, you go up to Boston, to Cambridge, actually to Cambridge, and you see the house that he lived in, that was a headquarters for George Washington when he was up there. It's a very opulent place. He was Professor Longfellow. Poe couldn't stand him. Ripped him to shreds every chance he could, you know, and he's probably right. Um, but he had to watch his wife burn. She got her dress caught in the fire and he had a roller in a, in a carpet and then she eventually died. So even, you know, so everybody had problems uh, that they faced. It's just the times that they lived in. And of course we've seen things too in our own lives. That's a lot from one question. I don't want to keep, you know, this is a typical problem with a ranger. You're seeing it, right? Even a former ranger. One question um, asked, and it just goes on and on, and then you're looking at your watch and saying, we got to move on. Yes. 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 The uh, Tomahawk Man. Yes. Uh, the question is about, he's uh, better known as a critic. Yeah. Yes. Well, he would tend to like women authors. The question is about who did he like and, and who did he like, uh, did not like. He didn't believe in what was known as puffing. Uh, think, I don't know how many years ago, somebody, some, either some theater or some uh, movie production got in trouble with you know, paying people to, to say great things about movies um, when they came out of the movie or something. So this is puffery. So he was not a fan of that, but a lot of times that helps you along. You, you, I, you puff me, I puff you, and he, he wanted to end that because he thought there was a lot of dreck out there. And this is a good way to get them to be known too. Um, who was the one that used to come up with the, the 10 worst dressed people? Blackwell? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we would like this. Well, we hate to admit this, but we like this kind of, you know, the gritty side of our nature. What's, what's wrong? What's... So people would find this entertaining, but if you, if you piss off certain people that are gonna be helping you along the way, 
But I thought Long, you know, Longfellow was rather common. Um, it's been a while since I've, I, can't, I can't give you the exact quotes, but it was what was known as the Longfellow War. And it would tend to get, maybe not personal, but really be over the top over time. And to Longfellow's credit, um, he wouldn't respond. And in fact, he helped uh, pose mother-in-law, who was his aunt. The three of them used to travel together. It's the, the mother-in-law, the aunt, uh, Clem, uh, Muddy Clem, Mariah Clem, and Virginia, the wife, who's also the first cousin, and, and Eddie Poe. Um, so he tried helping her because she was less left destitute and alone. And so to his credit, he would do that. But uh, yeah, you would go through that. And, uh, but he's very entertaining that way too. And that's how, you know, because I mean, he's working in magazines. So the best thing to do is to wear many different hats. Don't pigeonhole yourself. He would, if he appeared here before us today, he would rather be known as a poet. That's his first love. You know, Lord Byron to him was a hero. He was the rock star of the early age of the romantics, as Lord Byron. Because you can't make money that way. And up until that time, a lot of American authors were people like Washington Irving, uh, James Fenimore Cooper. Money's on the side. This is, you know, not their main profession. For Poe, people like Lepard, other uh, of his time period, they were trying to make money within that field. Even Melville. Uh, what's his big failure? Moby Dick, nobody could understand it. Didn't know what they meant. Failure. I mean, he's going to end up giving, getting a government job as collector of the ports. Nathaniel Hawthorne. What's that um, prologue to Scarlet Letter? Yeah, it's the custom house. And in those days, it's not civil service, is it? It's a political party. So he was a Democrat, then he's thrown out. That's that sort of thing. And Poe's trying to do the same thing, work in, in a custom house. Get a job here. Custom House at that time was, I think, near Society Hill Towers. So he thought his name was on it because the Whigs were, he was a Whig. So he's rather conservative. Um, though the Whigs probably would be looked at as, as liberal with, they believe in national railroads and national things, roads and things like that. Um, he, you also had to go at, at times to the White House to apply for a job. It doesn't help when you go to the White House drunk. And luckily, it, it's during the time of John Totter. So Robert Totter, the son, was a secretary. So he was able to, and he knows Poe, you know, through because he's a poet himself. So he stops Poe. So that that so Poe's very good at shooting his own foot. It, it, it gets infuriating really getting to know him because there's so much promise. But you know, when you're living a life, you can't see that. You, you're living day by day, and you're trying your best, and you know, and Poe being Poe and uh, it's what I call the Poe dance. You move one step forward, two steps back. Pretty much what he was doing all his life. Towards the end, things were beginning to, to look better for him, and then he dies. Coming back through Philadelphia, he was going to come back through Philadelphia to New York. And he dies in Baltimore on his way back from Richmond. And that's what also seals his, his it's almost like a Poe story, a Poe mystery. So it just makes this this even bigger because that's the thing that even with with a film that we have if you've ever seen a film and we don't know how poe dies what's the first thing that people ask when they come out of the film as how did he die what did he do you know there's 12 different theories and there's a theory every couple of years so that's all part of the poe war itself as well so it will continue until teachers stop teaching poe and you're usually getting introduced to Poe around seventh or eighth grade or high school, so it's perfect. But also it, it slants, and, and some teachers will have a, a wrong view. Isn't Poe this? No. Suppose this? No. And, and a lot of times people, when taking my tour up at Poe, would have this kind of look in their face because I'm not giving them what they want. And you know, it's a ranger for you. And it's, you know, that's what we do. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Charles um, Weekly Messenger, and I think that was on um, Franklin Court uh, as well. Uh, he was asking about cryptograms. Uh, Poe is very good in, uh, he's very good, he's, he's, he's very meticulous about things. He was a big cryptogram guy, and he would 
what, what was uh, you might know remember did he say send in this cryptogram and i'll and i'll um solve it for you and that kind of thing or give out cryptograms and yeah that was a big component as well we don't get to see that but i'm glad you knew that and that's about 1840 when he's kind of in between jobs between magazine just finished that and before Graham. So that was a big thing too as well. So he's really involved in the magazine trade. And what he wants is a magazine that's about $5 a year and use the best paper, best printer, best contributors, really high-minded. He's thinking PBS, okay? And uh, the people are not like that. They're, you know, what's today? What's the equivalent of today? Graham's magazine that he felt was Namby Pamby. Okay. Hmm? People magazine. Yeah. So there's a question like People magazine. Yeah. But how many people now? I mean, what I'm talking about, you understand, but now tell the audience about newspapers, younger audience today, newspapers, magazines. So, yes, I, I can't believe. It. Yeah. So I, I got out of a good time where, where it's now really beginning to see the gulf between their time and ours now to today. But we understand kind of we were at that time where we understand the tangible print media. Um, but it's vanishing. But, you know, I mean, people complained about the printing press when that, you know, taking all those people out of jobs who were scribes, you know, or the idea of a book being handwritten and costing, you know, the equivalent of thousands of dollars. And now you can print it for, you know, so people complained even then in the 15th century. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom. Thank you. And I, um, I'll figure out how to, you know, put some things out so you can take a look at. Okay, test, test. All right. So um, first thing I just want to bring up again, the bylaws vote, we have a week. Okay. okay. And then it's going to shut down. So what are the, do you have any numbers on that, Jen? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you haven't voted, please look them over. I know they're kind of lengthy and no, nothing um, really sexy about bylaws, but <laughs> read them over and then and cast your vote. And again, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to any board member or, or myself. Um, again, I brought this up um, and no one has uh, yet stepped forward. I mean, this is our year where we have elections. We will have elections at our December meeting. Um, so if you are, what we usually have, what we should have according to our, our laws and whatnot, um, is a nominating committee consisting of uh, three people. And that nominating committee can, consists of people who are definitely not running for a board position, but it's up to them to run the election and to get candidates. Um, so if you're interested in being on a nominating committee, I would, you know, please love for you to step forward and let me know okay otherwise guess what we have to assign some people to do this and i hate doing that but i have to go out and beg then it's like please be on the nominating committee um so again we haven't had elections in two years so and some of the board members will probably be running again so like you're you know maybe half of your you know work is already done for you if we already have people that are willing to run again um do, do, do what else so uh the uh i've talked about this again in constant contact and here we have a world conference that is going to happen in uh sicily in january uh, we've had a donation given to us of to help people attend 
So anyone who registers so far, the, all I know is the four of us have registered for the conference. If you have not registered, or if you have registered, but you haven't let me know, let me know. Um, or if you're considering it, just know that there'll be a little bit of help there um, in your registration fees or however you want to use it. Um, we thought it was really important to have representation at the World Conference because of America 250 coming up. This is becoming, hopefully, becoming a big deal. Um, and I've reached out to a number of organizations already. Uh, things are still very much in the like kind of planning stages, um, but there are a few associations and organizations in the city that are doing some things. Um, so we hope, again, to have representation at the World Conference um, to talk about Philadelphia, to be talking it up, um, which leads me to the next thing, which is the National Federation of Tour Guides, of which I attended their conference in San Antonio last January. So usually, again, the National Federation has their conference on one year and then the World Conference the next and we alternate that way. Um, the National Federation, and unfortunately they are having their Zoom meeting, they had to change it from Thursday to Wednesday and I said I wouldn't be there. Um, but they have approached me and asked if the National Conference could be returned here in Philadelphia in January of 2015. So I'm just throwing it out there. I, 20, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yes, <laughs> no, 2025. Um, so it would be um, January of 2025, okay? Um, and of course, this is gonna be a decision for the board, okay, to take on, but I would really love your input. Some of you here um, helped out uh, or were a big part, Tony. <laughs> um, the conference was here in 2018. Okay, um, and then it was in Charleston, and then we had COVID, so it was on even years, but because of COVID, now we're on an odd year, um, and then, like I said, so it was Philadelphia, Charleston, San Antonio, and now they want to come back to Philadelphia, um, and one of the reasons that, because they know that we have a great you know, organization here, and we can make it happen, a lot of the organizations have lost a lot of members because of COVID and are you know, just not as strong as they used to be. We were hoping to go to San Diego, but they have their board said absolutely not. Because it does take a lot of work, a lot of planning to host this kind of conference. So again, um, at this point, I can't say yes or no. I have to get my board approval. But if anyone has any input, again, those of you, Tony, <laughs> who I know worked feverishly on the 2018 conference, you know, let me know. Again, it would be a tremendous thing to really um, host uh, the conference here in preparation for 2026, because we're talking about the year ahead of time, and we could really concentrate on a lot of the things. Hopefully, by that point, things will be planned. And we'll have some great speakers to talk about what's going to happen in the city and yada yada. Um, which again, Marianne has put together a panel in November. I hope some of you joined her on her Zoom call the other night. Um, so again, leading up to all this, uh, she hopes to have a panel in November to talk about the declaration and to further study that um, and have a half day panel in November. So think about it again, I'm, I'm open to any ideas or suggestions, you know, positive or negative. If you say, no way, we shouldn't be doing that. Or yeah, I'd love to help. Again, it's, it's getting speakers, it's getting a hotel and rooms and usually about a hundred plus people attend. And if we do it right, um, you know, we, it could, we can make a little money too for, N for us, for APT. So just wanting everybody to know all that. Um, I think that's just about all that I have, except for I mentioned December, we'll have an election, we'll have a holiday party. Uh, last year, we had it here. Um, and hopefully maybe we'll be able to do that again. If anyone has another venue, another idea, uh, let us know. Okay, and that so we'll have elections and then the holiday 
party afterwards. But if you're tired of this place, <laughs> I mean, I think you did a good job last year, but you know, if you have, it's always a problem of, you know, trying to figure a place out of venue. So, and keep it, you know, within our, our ability to pay for it. Okay. Um, we'll open up membership again, probably in October, like we did last year. So we'll generate a little bit of uh, revenue ahead of time. So, okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, so the vote responses as of right now were 45 members have voted. So we didn't even close. So please vote. If you know another AP member, please kind of poke them um, because then I need to start getting kind of pokey and I'm, I'm a little meaner. <laughs> um, second on good news, um, I emailed this to Judy, but she's been busy and fabulous. Um, there was an article put it out, put out. I will also put it to our social media that the first bank got their grant funding. They got approved for $22.2 million. So they got their grant funding. So that I know that is something that we as APT have been kind of putting our finger on the pulse of. We've had meetings. So that is a positive because I know some of us as guides are a bit kind of wondering what to do with the cancellation of the Made in America concert that often brings a lot of tourism over Labor Day weekend. So in the short term, there's a little bit of a shock, but in the long term, there is some hope. So I thought kind of a little salt and sweet. There you go. Okay, so does anybody have anything else? Um, there are, a, I'm, I'm sorry, my, there are a number of new faces here. So if anyone would like to if new face, introduce yourself and <laughs> anyone? 